state of disaster in the state of Texas is our first story this Friday. Thank you all for taking 10 for CNN 10. I'm Carl Azus at the CNN Center. Imelda was the name of the storm system that is soaking parts of the Lone Star State. It formed as a tropical depression, strengthened to a tropical storm, and made landfall all on the same day. That was Tuesday. So there really wasn't time for people near Texas's Gulf Coast to make any major preparations. Still, Imelda wasn't projected to have anywhere near the impact that Hurricane Dorian had on the Bahamas earlier this month. But it did cause flooding, tremendous amounts of it in Texas. And even though Imelda is no longer a tropical storm, or a weaker tropical depression for that matter, Conditions were still worsening yesterday for many people in southeast Texas. In the city of Beaumont, for example, where the average rainfall is about 60 inches per year, police say the city got a third of that, as much as 20 inches in one night. Beaumont is in one of the 13 Texas counties where Governor Greg Abbott declared a state of disaster yesterday. That speeds up money and help to those in need, and there are a lot of people in need. Police say they've gotten hundreds of calls for rescues. People have been trapped in homes and cars. Residents are being told not to drive because the roads are flooded. And entire neighborhoods have become like lakes with houses and trees in the middle of them. As what's left of Imelda moves northeast, millions of people in eastern Texas and western Louisiana were told to keep an eye out for possible flash floods. Some victims are comparing this storm to Hurricane Harvey. And it certainly caused the worst flooding in the region since Harvey did this in 2017. Though that storm was considered to be an even bigger rainmaker, Imelda's threat continues with more rain in the forecast before it completely moves out of Texas. Well, this was Imelda, the storm that really was only a tropical storm. It didn't really ever turn into a hurricane, but that's not the point. It has tropical moisture with it, and that tropical moisture has just been sitting right from Houston and then points eastward all the way toward Beaumont, and I-10 is completely underwater, completely shut down around Beaumont. We are going to see this now. This water is going to take a long time for it to run off. Even now toward Woodland and Houston, getting in on a little bit more rainfall from the north here. Coming down, you'll see heavier rainfall here. What the biggest story here is this white area here from Winnie. This is over toward Beaumont. There's 350 square miles of 20 inches of rain or more. That's 15 times the size of Manhattan covered with 20 inches of rain or more. And some of these these gauges now are out of control. We don't know if we believe them or not, but up to 40 inches of rain in some spots there to the southwest of Beaumont. For the second time since July, the United States Federal Reserve cut interest rates this week. The federal funds rate was reduced a quarter of a percentage point, and it'll now hover between 1.75% and 2%. Does that affect individual Americans? Yes, because lower interest rates make it cheaper to borrow money. Payments on mortgages, payments on credit card balances, what businesses have to pay back when they borrow. All of that can decrease when the Fed cuts interest rates. It's a move the central bank can make to influence the U.S. economy, and analysts think that economy will continue to grow in the months ahead and that the nation's unemployment rate will stay near its lowest levels in 50 years. But there are concerns that global growth will slow down. This rate cut, according to the Fed chairman, was made to keep the U.S. economy strong. Let's go all the way back to the late 19th century when people couldn't trust that their money was safe in the bank, and bank runs weren't unusual. That led to the creation of the country's central bank, the Federal Reserve, in 1913. It was the first step toward adding safety and stability to America's financial system. Today, the Fed is essentially the architect of America's money policy. It's run by a board of governors based in Washington, D.C., and has 12 Federal Reserve banks around the country. Those bank presidents and the board meet eight times a year to make big policy decisions, decisions that affect the Fed's two main goals, to make sure prices are stable and that everyone who wants a job has a job. So how exactly does the Fed do this? Mainly using three tools. First, by adjusting the discount rate. That's the interest rate the Fed charges commercial banks for short-term loans. And it's one of the most influential interest rates there is. The Dow had its biggest point drop in history today. For example, in 2008, when the economy was tanking. Some companies may not be able to make their payroll. They may have to shut down or shift at a plant. That means people will lose their jobs. More people will lose their homes. People will have difficulty getting loans. 
The Fed, in an unprecedented move, cut interest rates to zero, making it cheaper to borrow money. This plan is an emergency plan to put out a fire, to resolve a serious crisis which has real Main Street implications. The Fed can't force banks to lend or companies to hire, but it can use its tools to create an environment for economic growth. Second trivia, which of these contraptions was invented first? Vacuum cleaner, AM radio, Bakelite, or Penny Farthing? Penny Farthing for your thoughts. It's the only one of these inventions made before the 20th century. And here is what a penny farthing looks like. It's also known as a high wheel bicycle for obvious reasons. It appeared on the scene around the year 1870 and historians believe it led to the invention of the unicycle because why not leave the relative safety of two wheels for just one? If keeping balance while mountain biking is more challenging than road biking, let's turn 10 out of 10 up to 11 and go off-roading on a mountain unicycle. Yeah, if you are a unicyclist, you see the world really, really different. If I go through a city and I see a bench, for me it's not a bench, it's something where I think, can I jump on it? So the world is an obstacle for me. I always think, is this too steep? Is it possible to jump on this rock? So it really changes my perspective on everything. My name is Lutz Eichholz, I'm a professional mountain unicyclist. That means I unicycle in the mountains. I started unicycling at the age of nine. First, I only unicycled on the street, and over the years, I got more and more extreme, and now I unicycle mostly in the mountains. I really like to go down big mountains, so I did a 5,600 meter mountain in Iron a couple of years ago, and I want to go on even higher mountains. I unicycled on five continents, so on many, many places in the world. The biggest challenge on a unicycle is to always stay in balance. Technically, the most important movement are my legs, because I always have to pedal, so my legs are always moving. Then my right arm I use to balance, so I move it up and down. My left arm maintains the brake. If I go down on hard terrain, I'm not thinking at all. I'm just in the moment. I'm 100% focused just on the sport, on the movement, because if I start to think, for sure I would fall down. I like to do stuff which is not done by so many people. And I think it's a bigger challenge. If you don't have people, you can copy and you have to invent a sport a little bit by yourself. It's really unique, it's really special. And I think that's a big part why I like it so much. Well, he spoke of some really interesting points, if not universal ones. It's hard to switch gears and can even grind your gears if you know you've only got one and not everyone would peddle the idea of taking a seat where a wheelie is the only way to ride. You're only keeping it half as wheel as a bicycle. Still, as we ride off into the sunset for the week, we hope you'll keep it in the road even if you go off-road and we thank you for keeping CNN 10 your number one for news. I'm Carl Azus.